Act Four of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is the same as in the preceding act, but the light outside is brighter and warmer, and in the room is more diffused. On the table in the center, Placed close to the settee, there is a small tray with a breakfast of tea and toast upon it. The bedroom door is partly open. Lily, wan and red-eyed, is lying propped up by cushions upon the settee. A newspaper is on her lap, but she is gazing at vacancy. She is in negligee. A dainty morning robe covers her nightgown. Her bare feet are in slippers, and her hair is in a simple knot. Maud is at one of the drawers of the cupboard at the back, engaged in selecting some articles of lingerie, and Mrs. Upjohn, completely dressed for the day, is sitting in the armchair by the center table, her face hidden by a newspaper which she is reading. Presently Maud shuts the drawer, and carrying the lingerie comes forward. Maud to Lily. What frock will you put on? Lily, starting slightly. Eh? One of your embroidered muslins? Or your ninon? Lily languidly. Either. I don't care. Oh, gracious. What on earth is the matter with you this morning? I've never known you as queer as this after any hop you've been to in my time. To Mrs. Upjohn, who has lowered her paper. Nothing wrong, is there? Lily turning over her and burying her head in the cushions. Maud. Maud moving to the settee and bending over Lily. Here I am, lovey. Go into the next room and shut the door, and don't let me see your stupid, fat face till I come to you. Ha ha ha! That's better. Go into the bedroom door. That's how I like to hear her talk. We needn't send for Dr. Gilson yet a while. <laughs> she disappears into the bedroom and closes the door. Mrs. Upjohn looking at Lily. Lil? Yes, mother? Have another cup of tea, won't you? No. Another bit of toast, then? No. Smoke a cigarette? No. You always do have a whip after your breakfast. Come. No. Mrs. Upjohn rising and walking away. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Deuce take Carlton Smythe and his supper party. Those are my sentiments. And Lal Ropa, busybody that he is, things were going on with us as smooth and peaceful as could be before this upset. Lily raising herself angrily. You were in it, mother. You were as much to blame as anybody. Mrs. Upjohn halting. How in it? In Uncle Lal's artful plan to prevent Nico from being invited. You've confessed you were. Lal twisted me round his little finger. I was clay in the potter's hand, as your dad was fond of saying. Lily changing her position. If only Nico had been there, I shouldn't have given young Farncombe all those dances, nor wandered about with him in the intervals, nor allowed him to see me home. It all simply wouldn't, couldn't have happened. Hitting a cushion. Oh. Sitting up and embracing her knees. Mother. Mrs. Upjohn behind the settee. What? Lily knitting her brows. I... I'm so surprised at myself. Surprised? So... so disappointed with myself. Why, you haven't done anything that's... that's not quite respectable, Lil. On the contrary. No, I haven't done anything that's actually not nice. But... Fancy. Mrs. Upjohn close to Lily. Fancy? Lily opening her eyes widely. Fancy my letting myself go with young Farncombe as I did. He, he'd been admiring me from a distance for weeks and weeks, but I'd scarcely noticed him till last night. Leaning her head against Mrs. Upjohn softly. I... I always thought I was such a cold girl, mother, in, in that way. 
I suppose it was what's called love at first sight, Lil. Lily laughing shamefacedly. <laughs> Putting her feet to the ground and shielding her face with her hands. Oh, don't talk rot, mother. Mrs. Upjohn moving away. Anyhow, it's not too late, Lil. Even now. Not too late. Mrs. Upjohn behind the center table. To back out, dearie. The captain couldn't possibly hold you to a hasty promise given him between four and five in the morning. Oh, oh, how can you? I've passed my word to Nico, and I wouldn't break it for twenty thousand pounds. Looking up. Mother. Mrs. Upjohn fussing with the things upon the table. Yes. Lily resolutely. I'm going to pull Nico up, mother. I've dragged him down, and I mean to raise him. Clenching her hands. So help me God, I do. Well, you've got a tough job before you, Lil, in my opinion. Perhaps, but I mean to succeed. After a pause. Besides. Besides? Lily, slowly. I've told you, Nico or no Nico, I'm determined. I'm determined not to draw Eddie Farncope into my net. Into your net? Another pause. Lil. Eh? That's twice you've made use of that remark. Who's accused you? There is a lively rat-tat at the door on the left. Come in. The door opens and Jimmy Birch bounces into the room. Jimmy as she closes the door. Ah, Ma. Ah, Lillums. Good morning. Jimmy kissing Mrs. Upjohn. <laughs> We've met before, this morning, haven't we? Coming to Lily. Well, dear old girl, and how are you today? Kissing Lily and then eyeing her keenly. A wreck? Rather. I ought to be, but I'm not. Directly I laid my pretty head on my pillow, I went off, and never stirred, till I found the breakfast tray on my chest. Reckoning on her fingers. Five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to ten, ten to eleven. I've had six hours. That's not so dusty. To Lily slyly. You didn't sleep very soundly, probably. Not very. Jimmy smiling from ear to ear. Excited? Lily shrugs her shoulders. There is a silence, and then Jimmy, still beaming, looks round and sees that Mrs. Upjohn has seated herself upon the fauteuil stool. May I sit down for a minute? Of course, Jimmy. Do. Jimmy sits in the armchair by the center table, awaiting some communication which doesn't come. Mrs. Upjohn drums upon the table with her fingers, and Lily busies herself with rearranging the cushions on the settee. Jimmy, after a while. Hope I haven't dropped in too early. Lily settling her shoulders into the cushions. Not a bit, dear. It's nearly half past twelve. I, I dashed round. After another pause, unable to restrain herself further. Any news? Any, any, anything to tell me? Mrs. Upjohn abruptly. Yes. What? Lil's engaged. Ha! <laughs> Triumphantly. Ha, ha. Clapping her hands and beating her feet upon the floor. Ha, 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 ha. Jumping up and sitting beside Lily and hugging and kissing her. Oh, 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 yum, yum, yum. Oh, you humbugs. Rising and rushing to Mrs. Upjohn and embracing her. You solemn humbug, Ma. Leaving Mrs. Upjohn and singing and dancing to the refrain sung in the previous act. Oh, if you would only, only love me. <laughs> if you would merely, merely say. Her voice gradually dying away as she sees that the expression on Lily's face and upon Mrs. Upjohn's doesn't alter. Wait, but 
Little, little. Standing still. Little for me. Mrs. Upjohn caustically. Yes, you had better wait a little. You better wait till you hear who. She's engaged too. Who to? Lily studying her nails. Whom to, mother? Why, isn't it? No, it ain't. It's the captain. The, the cap? To Lily. Nico? Lily nods. Jimmy draws a deep breath. Oh. Lily calmly. Nico turned up here early this morning, while Eddie, uh, well, Lord Farncoe, was with me, in fact. And I, we, the three of us, we talked matters over, and, and... Jimmy, her eyes starting out of her head. Was there a row? Oh, don't be so curious, Jimmy. Poor Nico has been after me for six years. A girl must play the game, if she's at all decent and wishes to preserve a shred of self-respect. Again there is a pause. Then Jimmy silently resumes her seat in the armchair. Mrs. Upjohn moistening her lips with her tongue to Jimmy. How do you feel about it? Jimmy thoughtfully. How do do I feel about it? To Lily. May I say? Lily, coldly. Certainly. Jimmy rubbing the arm of her chair with the palm of her hand. Well, if I were on board a ship at this moment, I should be ringing for the stewardess. That's how I feel about it. Lily throwing herself face downward at full length upon the settee. Oh! Oh, you're just like the rest of our girls on the question of marriage. You, you, you're detestable. Jimmy sliding out of her chair and kneeling at the settee and putting an arm round Lily. Oh, Lil, Lil. Lily repulsing her. Yes, yes, you are. Raising herself upon her elbow. You'd rejoice to see me draw this boy into my net, wouldn't you? You know you would. Mrs. Upjohn rises and comes forward. I dare say you jolly well wouldn't object to catching him yourself if you'd have the chance. Fiercely. You try it. You try it. You or any of you. Jimmy attempting to rise, scandalized. Oh! Lily holding her. No, no, Jimmy. Lil, I'm perfectly ashamed of you, speaking to Jimmy Birch in that manner. Lily dropping her head on Jimmy's shoulder. Oh, she doesn't mean it. I hope not. It ain't exactly pleasant to have a dog in the manger for a daughter. To Lily. Why shouldn't young Farmcombe turn his attention to Miss Birchprey or to any young lady who doesn't object to take your leavings? Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn. Hush, hush, hush. Mrs. Upjohn walking about. No, I won't hush. Jimmy to Lily quietly. I'll come back in the afternoon. Lil seems to have got some maggot or other in her brain about drawing Lord Farncombe into her net. Net, indeed. Jimmy, not heeding Mrs. Upjohn, arranges Lily comfortably upon the settee, and then rises and smooths out her skirt, preparatory to departure. As Lal Roper was saying yesterday, our tip-top aristocratic English families ought to be extremely grateful that strong, healthy professionals of the class of Miss Arker and Miss Travail and Miss Shafto are entering their ranks, and if Lil chooses to be peg-added enough. Jimmy makes a movement towards Mrs. Upjohn. Have a bought old ginger beer before you go. There is a prolonged, playful knocking at the door on the left followed on the part of those in the room by a gloomy pause. That is Lal. Lily groaning. Oh. Jimmy drawing a long face. Hmm. Lily to Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, stay. 
the knocking is repeated jimmy retreats to the right as mrs upjohn goes to the door and opens it roper is outside roper entering in high spirits hello 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 embracing mrs upjohn morning ma advancing any more bids for the handsome gilt candelabra with the crystal drops <laughs> to jimmy morning jimmy looking down upon lily eagerly well lil well my pet lily in a weary tone giving him the tips of her fingers and then turning upon her side with her face to the back of the settee how are you uncle lel roper chilled oh i thank you lil after a short pause to mrs upjohn glancing at lily not up to much today mrs upjohn glumly no great shakes dancing too hard i spect a deal too hard roper after another pause anything else amiss ma mrs upjohn sitting upon the box ottoman to jimmy who is at the piano examining some of the music you tell loud jimmy tell to jimmy who comes to the settee apprehensively jimmy jimmy behind the settee gravely no the old pandora isn't going to score this time lal isn't going to i don't follow you be plain jimmy jimmy endeavoring to relieve the situation <laughs> nature's taken precious good care of that in my case roper angrily now look here jimmy a jest is a capital thing in its way no man has a keener sense of humour than lal roper but there are occasions when it's out of place and this is one of them my dear and if it's not putting you to serious inconvenience jimmy also losing her temper oh well then have it in the neck lil's declined young fawncombe there and when you crack a joke next mr roper i beg you'll contrive to favour us with a little variety flouncing away because you bore me pallid with your rotten wheezes and always have done roper going to mrs upjohn aghast at the tidings ma mrs upjohn to roper under her breath won't draw him into her net uncle won't draw him into a jimmy at the back k n e double t net mrs upjohn pacifically jimmy jimmy mimicking roper derisively hello 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 fresh fish from the sea buy em on the beach buy em on the beach buy em on the beach roper to jimmy indignantly jimmy birch jimmy sitting upon the fauteuil stool ha ha roper to mrs upjohn wiping his brow of course there is this to be said ma rallying at the idea it may be wise of dear lil to decline farcombe at first it, it 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 doesn't do for a girl does it to appear to throw herself at any man let alone a young fellow of the position the the, the social status lily suddenly sitting up and putting her feet to the floor again oh for mercy's sake cease discussing my affairs in my presence to mrs upjohn mother why do you keep uncle lal in the dark to jimmy jimmy why don't you in the dark yes lal you're flying out at jimmy over her armless joke stopped her finishing finishing lil's not only refused young farm coat but she's gone and plighted herself to another individual plighted herself lily passionately to one of the best to one of the best roper stupefied do i do i know him <laughs> know him you know him sufficiently to have plotted and schemed to prevent his being asked to the party last night jimmy to lily did lel do that did he impudence roper sitting in the armchair by the centre table quietly chase nico lily firmly nico 
But the captain was at the party last night, notwithstanding. Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn. Nonsense, ma. Yes, Nico managed to get into the theatre somehow or other. And watched you and young Farncombe. And stationed himself under the portico of twenty-seven to see who brought me home. Oh, he's always been frightfully jealous, the captain, miss. Jimmy looking at Roper. Oh, so really it's entirely owing to Lal Roper's interference that matters were brought to a head this morning. Lily, her eyes flashing. Entirely. Mrs. Upjohn joining in the attack upon Roper. Yes, if Lal had been content to mind his own business. And hadn't meddled. And muddled things might have gone on much the same as before and might have ended different lily rising and walking away to the right ah no mother jimmy rising and joining lily certainly they might mrs upjohn rising anyhow i hope it'll be a lesson to allow do you ma mrs upjohn moving over to the girls not to put his fingers into other people's paws. Jimmy to Mrs. Upjohn with a withering glance at Roper. Oh, you are sanguine. Roper rising and straightening himself out. Ma, Mrs. Upjohn, uh, Lily. Jimmy scornfully. Hello, 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 hello. Roper to Jimmy. Psh! Impressively. Ma. Lily, for years, longer than it's agreeable to count, I've been a patron of the drama, particularly musical comedy, of which I studied the development with especial interest. Jimmy resting her elbows upon the back of the settee. Yes, you've studied a lot of development, Lal, in your day. Roper ignoring Jimmy. It's been a fad with me. I put it no higher than that. Producing his gloves. But I've devoted time to it. Any amount. Roper drawing a glove on. Often to the neglect of my ventures in the city. Here I am now, for instance. Huh, that's obvious. And, I frankly admit it, I've had more than one serious dispute with Mrs. Roper on the subject. Jimmy softly whistles a few bars of Rule Britannia. Yesterday, by a coincidence, feeling the outside of his breast pocket. Letter from the wife, full of complaints, haven't been to Bexhill to her and the kids for weeks. And to do Ellen Roper justice, she's not the woman to grumble without cause. Picking up his hat and cane, which he has placed upon the center table. Dash it all, home ties are home ties. Polishing his hat with his sleeve. And taking one consideration with another, and after this, this occurrence it's my intention for the future my firm intention lily returning to roper and throwing her arms around his neck oh uncle lel not altogether we're tired and cross this morning not altogether mrs upjohn behind the center table no no uncle you mustn't lily to roper forgive us coaxingly Mother and Jimmy are cats. Oh! The door on the left opens, and Gladys enters with a card on a salver. Gladys advancing to Lily. Are you in? In? Gladys surveying Lily with mingled disdain and pity. Oh, you do look washed out. Lily going to Gladys. Never you mind whether I look washed out or not. Who is it? Lily takes the card, reads some writing upon it, and stands twiddling the card in her fingers. They're in the dining room. Lily to Gladys, after a pause. Wait outside, on the landing. Oh, all right. This won't get my silver cleaned. Gladys withdraws. Lily waits for the door to close, and then walks about distractedly. Oh, why can't they leave me alone? What do they want with me now, both of them? Mrs. Upjohn moving towards Lily. Oh, Nico's downstairs. 
with Lord Farncombe. Lord Farncombe? And Jay's. Billy reading the card again. Nico asked me to see him and the boy together. Roper and Mrs. Upjohn go to Lily, one on each side of her, and try to read the card. She pushes them from her and sits in the armchair by the center table. I won't. I won't. Jimmy joining Mrs. Upjohn and Roper. Yes, yes, Lil, do. Mrs. Upjohn bewildered. Perhaps they've arrived at a friendly understanding. Understanding? Jimmy excitedly. And have come to propose that Lil should choose between them. Great Scott! I have chosen. I have chosen. It's settled. Undoubtedly she ought to see them. It's a shame to persecute me so. A shame. Jimmy, Mrs. Upjohn and Roper behind Lily's chair. Lil, Lil, Lily. Lily, give him a minute, dear. Hear what they've got to say. It would be uncivil not to. Oh, oh. Buck up, Lil. My pet. Uh, to reason, dearie. Lil. 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 Lily. 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 Lily yielding helplessly. Oh, very well. Ah. Uh. Tell Gladys when I ring. Jimmy flying to the door on the left. I'll tell her. Roper to Mrs. Upjohn importantly. Lucky I was on the spot. Lucky I was on the spot. Jimmy on the landing to Gladys. Bring the gentleman up when Miss Lily rings. Lily rising and pacing the room on the right. Give me some stockings. Mrs. Upjohn hurrying into the bedroom. Yes, dearie. As she disappears. Maud. Jimmy returning and closing the door and then whispering to Roper. Bet my boots, that's it. Roper to Jimmy in a whisper. Choose between em. What else can it be? I can't. Jimmy throwing herself into Roper's arms. Oh, if it is. Roper hugging her. Oh. Jimmy suddenly releasing herself. Oh. Haughtily. Thought you were Lily. Mrs. Upjohn returns carrying a pair of stockings. Lily seats herself upon the fauteuil stool, where, concealed by the center table, she draws on the stockings with Mrs. Upjohn's assistance. Lily whimpering. Oh, oh. Don't, dearie, don't. Mother's here. Roper impatiently. I, uh, I think I'll run downstairs and shake hands with Jays and Farncombe while Lily's tidying herself. Jimmy, who has moved over to the right, to Roper. Be careful. I should advise you not to risk it. Roper at the door. Risk it? If Nico knows you were the cause of his being shut out of the party last night, he'll simply throttle you. Roper opening the door. Throttle me? Throttle Lal Roper? He disappears, closing the door, as Maud enters from the bedroom with a pair of shoes. Lily weakly. Get me something to keep these up with. Jimmy to Maud. Ribbon. Mrs. Upjohn snatching the shoes from Maud. Ribbon. Maud opens one of the drawers underneath the further cupboard on the left and finds a roll of bright new ribbon, while Jimmy, searching among the objects on the center table, discovers the case of manicure instruments and takes from it a pair of scissors. Lily putting on her shoes to Mrs. Upjohn. No, no, that's the left foot. Oh. Don't agitate yourself, dearie. Mother's here. Maud comes to the center table with the ribbon, and Jimmy cuts off two links from the roll. Maud to Jimmy. Morning, Miss Jimmy. Morning. Lily to Mrs. Upjohn. Where's the mirror? Where's the mirror? Mrs. Upjohn taking the mirror from the table and giving it to Lily. Here it is, dearie. Here it is. I'm here too. Lily viewing herself in the mirror and running her hand over her hair. Oh, how horrid I look. Jimmy goes to Lily with two lengths of ribbon, and Maud replaces the roll in the drawer. Ring the bell. Jimmy hands Lily the garters, relieving her of the mirror, and Mrs. Upjohn hastens to the fireplace 
and presses the bell push continuously that'll do maud you hook it maud going to the bedroom door <laughs> that's how i like to hear her talk <laughs> maud vanishes into the bedroom closing the door and lily having tied up her stockings rises and comes to the settee mrs upjohn still pressing the bell push now i don't believe i've rung lily at the uttermost tension ah uh, stop it mother stop it sitting on the settee we're not calling the fire brigade jimmy at the back of the settee to lily i'll wait in your bedroom till the men have been shown up and sneak out that way bending over lily mind if nico is willing after all that you should make your choice mrs upjohn advancing yes dear if he is willing lily frantically i tell you i have made it i keep on telling you i've chosen i've chosen i've chosen clenching her hands if you torment me any more either of you mrs upjohn and jimmy retreat precipitately to the bedroom door they open the door and then standing in the doorway listen intently jimmy disappearing <sighs> mrs upjohn partially disappearing ah only her head visible speaking to lily in a hoarse whisper mother's here dearie the head is withdrawn and the door softly closed after a pause gladys enters at the other door followed by g's and farncombe the men are carrying their hats and canes gladys retires closing the door and g's comes to lily and shakes hands with her g's to lily gently how are you today lil very fat i am a little g's turns from her to lay his hat and cane upon the box ottoman and then farncombe who has hung back advances hesitatingly to the further side of the center table and bows to Lily. She rises, and avoiding his eyes, gives him a limp hand across the table. How'd you do? To G's, who, having got rid of his hat and cane, moves away from the ottoman. Sit down, won't you? She resumes her seat upon the settee, and G's, with a nod, sits in the armchair by the center table. Farncombe remains standing, and again she addresses him without meeting his eyes. And you? Farncombe, with another bow, sits upon the fauteuil stool. There is a brief silence, and then G speaks. Lil. Yes? In the first place, Farncombe wants you distinctly to understand how it is he's committing this breach of his compact with you. To Farncombe. You promised? I promised never to attempt to come near Miss Paradell again, nor even to enter the theatre. G's to Lily. And if I'm any judge of a man, Lily, Farncombe would have kept his promise. He'd have kept it faithfully, but for me. I've brought him along, insisted on it. Emphatically. I've brought him along. See? Why, Nico? I'll tell you, my dear. You remember when we left you early this morning, ordering us to walk away together and to part good friends? Perfectly. Well, we did walk away together, and we did part good friends. But we didn't part at all till some hours later, in his rooms. We didn't part till I'd made him stand by me and listen to me while I had a long jaw with my brother on the phone. Lily wonderingly. With your... About that Rhodesian business. What Rhodesian business? I mentioned it to you yesterday. Bob owns a third, with Peter Chalmers and Tom Dalby, of a group of farms near Bulawayo, and he's been badgering me eternally to cut this and to settle out there as their agent. And I've accepted, old girl. Lily with a blank face. Acceptant? Jeez, grimly. Leaving you to bring an action against me, to recover damages for a broken heart. Drawing a deep breath. Yes, I'm chucking you, Lil. I give you formal notice of my intention, and you can drive down to your solicitors this afternoon and instruct them to writ me without delay. 
forcing a laugh. <laughs> Nico! Unless, unless you've an idea of consoling yourself shortly with, with another chap, and prefer not to carry the matter into court. Lily about to rise. Nico! G's restraining her by a gesture. Shh! No, no, no. She sinks back. Ah, Lil, Lil, I know you're full of generous, honest impulses, though I did tear you to rags in Farncombe's hearing a few hours ago. But I'm not going to allow you to sacrifice yourself to them. I, I, I've come to my senses, and I'm not going to permit it. Bending forward. Oh, my dear, why should I make you pay for the weaknesses of my character? Because that's what it'd amount to. I've bullied you for having played Skittles with my life, my career. So you have. Damn it, so you have. But you've done it out of blind thoughtlessness. And if I'd been a fairly strong man, with some ballast in me, you couldn't have landed me where I am. Not you, nor fifty Pandora girls. Sitting erect. And that, that's the moral of the tale. And, and... Abruptly to Farncombe. There's nothing more, is there, Farncombe? Farncombe, brokenly. Except that... that I'd like to repeat... What I've already said to Jay is that I... His elbows on the table, his head bowed. Oh, you make me feel terribly small, Jace. Again there is a pause. And then Lily struggles to her feet and holds out her hands to G's uncertainly. And at once he rises and takes her in his arms. Farncombe also rises, and standing beside the settee, Turns his back to G's and Lily. Lily to G's, choking. Oh, Nico, I can't, I can't. G's patting her shoulder. Ah. Uh. Why, what, what would become of my resolutions? Resolutions? To, to raise you up, Nico. You are raising me up, setting me on my legs again. Lily in a fright. And, and drawing Eddie into my net. Oh, we've talked of that too, he and I. He's given me an account of what passed between you here. My dear girl, your conscience may be quite clear on that point. Nobody can ever reproach you with trying to draw him into your net. They would. They would. At all events, the task you have to face now is to prove to the world. His world. That Miss Paradell is equal to playing lead on a bigger stage than the stage of the Pandora. Holding her at arm's length and shaking her fondly. And you'll do it! Ho 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 ho! You'll do it! Ha ha ha! His voice dies away miserably, and he releases her. Then, pulling himself together, he looks at his watch. Well, I've got to go to lunch with Bob at half-past one at the Junior Carlton. Lily agitatedly. It's not nearly that, Nico. It's not nearly that. Nico! She passes him, moving towards the door on the left, as if to intercept him, and then turns to him. A strip of ribbon lies upon the spot where she has been standing. After gazing at it for a moment, he stoops and picks it up. Oh! He folds the ribbon carefully and puts it into his pocket. Oh! Hitching up her stocking to her robe piteously. <laughs> <laughs> they face one another laughing, and then she sits upon the fauteuil stool and drops her head upon the table, and he fetches his hat and cane from the box ottoman. Nico! Nico! She's coming to her. Oh, this isn't goodbye, Lil. Not by any manner or means, my dear. We'll kill the fatted calf several times before I start. You, I, and the boy. Besides, by and by, you and he must take a trip and come out to see me. Syringa Vale is the farm where I shall be quartered, Bob tells me. Looking into space. German Street to Syringa Vale. Shaking himself. Pfft, there are no great distances in these days. 
to farncombe with a change of tone farncombe farncombe comes forward you dine with me tonight recollect it's an engagement yes eight o'clock eight o'clock Kitanis. Kitanis. without looking at lily again jeez goes to the door and opens it farncombe follows him and the two men halt in the doorway Jeez to Farncombe with a motion of his head towards Lily. And afterwards you fetch her from the theatre and take her home. That's your job. Lily rising. Oh! Farncombe goes out onto the landing with Jeez and parts from him at the top of the stairs. Then Farncombe slowly returns, closes the door, and finds Lily sitting upon the settee in a woeful attitude. Farncombe coming to Lily and standing before her thoughtfully. Lily. I? Huh? I'm afraid there's one thing finer than winning the woman you love, and when you've won her, being prepared to go through fire and water for her. What's that? Having the courage to give her up, as Jay's has done. Lily with a renewed outburst. Oh, Nico, poor Nico, poor Nico! Farncombe sitting beside her and taking her hand consolingly. By George, he's a brick, isn't he? Lily, after a pause, drying her eyes. Eddie? Yes? If, if ever we marry... Farncombe, his jaw falling. If? When, then? When we marry... You'll be obliged to resign your commission in the guards, won't you? Farncombe snapping his fingers. Psh! I shan't care a rap about that. Lily snatching her hand away. The snobs, the snobs! They'd let you marry any bit of trash in your own set. But a Pandora girl, though she's as pure as the Queen of England. Oh, the contemptible snobs! Farncombe regaining possession of her hand. Shh, shh, it, it's the practice. Blow the practice. A cheerful reflection for me it'll be, the errant snobs. Farncombe stroking her hand. Ah, ah. And then, poor mother. You, you won't be very proud of poor mother. Your mother. Boyishly. Oh, she... she's an awfully good sort. She hasn't an H to her name. Farncombe inadvertently. She oughtn't to have. Lily withdrawing her hand again, sharply. She calls herself Hupjoin, you mean? Farncombe distressed. No, no, no. In a difficulty. Um, at any rate, H's don't lead you to heaven, do they? Lily gloomily. You're right. Mothers lead her to Evan. Rising and walking away. Well, you'd better go now. Farncombe rising. And tonight? No, I'll come home alone. Lily. Please. When? Lily moving to the door on the left. Not for two or three days. Give me time to shake down over this. Farncombe taking up his hat and cane, which he has left upon the center table. Sunday? Lily, fretfully. No. Monday? Lily, opening the door. No. Farncombe joining her at the door. Tuesday? Lily, appealingly. I... all right. Again, he takes her hand, she keeping him at a distance. He attempts to lessen the distance, but she checks him, shaking her head. Not just yet, Eddie. He smiles at her tenderly, and with a bow, departs. From the doorway she watches him disappear, then she shuts the door and wanders listlessly to the door of the bedroom. Her hand lingers upon the knob for a moment, and then she opens the door a little way and calls. Mother! Mother! She leaves the door and is returning to the settee when Mrs. Upjohn enters. Mrs. Upjohn, all agog. Yes, Lil? 
Lily seats herself upon the settee without speaking. Yes, dearie, yes. Advancing to the center table. Have they given you your choice? Lily dully. No, they've given me no choice. Mrs. Upjohn advancing further. What? Nico's going out to South Africa, mother. South Africa? Well, to Rhodesia. Then you're free, Lil. No, I'm not. Not? Nico... Nico's handed me over, mother. Handed you over? To Lord Farncombe. Mrs. Upjohn gasping. <gasps> and you weren't the young chap, man. I... I suppose so. Oh. Sinking into the armchair by the center table. Oh, the dear captain. Lily transferring herself from the settee to Mrs. Upjohn's lap. Oh, oh, oh. Putting her arms round Mrs. Upjohn's neck. Oh, poor Nico. Mrs. Upjohn soothingly. He'll have his reward, Lil. He'll have his reward hereafter. And poor Carlton Smith. Oh, poor Carlton. Poor Carlton? He's losing every one of his best girls, mother. Gwenny Harker, Mady Travail, Eva Shafto, and now me. Oh, poor Carlton. Hush, dearie, hush. Don't consider him. Rocking Lily to and fro like a baby. Think. Think what a lot of good you're all doing to the aristocracy. The door on the left opens and Jimmy and Roper look in gleefully and then tiptoe towards Lily and Mrs. Upjohn. End of Act 4 End of The Mind the Paint Girl by Arthur Wing Pinero.